Cool. Uh, I will say hi in the chat. My iPad here. Good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Hi, I am the DDR man. Welcome. Are you the the man who's really good at dance, dance revolution, or are you like uh, DDR dynamic data R RAM? <laughs> DDR RAM, kind of an older RAM style, I guess as well. Uh, Tri Raptor, good to see you. Uh, Tri Raptor is one of our beta testers, I think, very active and finds a lot of interesting problems for me to solve. <laughs> and Seamus Butler as well, welcome. Hope everyone can hear me okay, and uh, we'll get into some stuff. Uh, so yeah, uh, One Deck uh, One Deck Dungeon Aeon's End is the game we're going to be working on today. Uh, it is well into beta testing, and um, it's been going really well. And I don't need headphones in, just have the microphone here, so uh, should be all right. Uh, cool. So the first thing I kind of wanted to show was a few of the sort of new things that have been added to the game um, since the last dev stream. Uh, and so let's just run through it here and, uh, and see. So uh, I think last time there probably wasn't an option screen, so that's a new thing, I guess. Uh, not super exciting, but it is a big part of game development is building different screens. Uh, we also have uh, how to play section with the rules that Jennifer has been working on quite a bit. Uh, lots of stuff uh, progressing in there. Uh, and I'm going to pop into the new game screen here where uh, we've added a lot. So you can now uh, randomize uh, individual sections. Uh, so you can choose a random nemesis. You can choose uh, random mages. Uh, the first time you hit it, it will uh, pick a random number of mages as well, and then it will keep choosing those same number. So if you'd like to play with two mages, you can just like click two mages and then, uh, or if you'd like to play with three, click three and hit random again, it will uh, change that up. Um, we also have uh, a way to randomize the supply. Uh, and this is using the market uh, setup cards that are part of Eon's End. I think they were a Kickstarter bonus, but uh, you can see so you can choose a different kind of setup and hit random and it will randomize sort of within those parameters but of course you can always just pick exactly the supply you want. Uh, we also have a difficulty level uh, selection between beginner, normal, expert and extinction. Those are all supported now and yeah let's choose a random supply here and jump in against Crooked Mask. Uh, there's going to be some things that don't work, but uh, we will, you know, fix those things up. Uh, part of part of what we're doing today is uh, working on some crooked mask things uh, that might not be necessarily working. Uh, a few other, oh, sorry, a few other things that we've added to. Uh, you know, there's actually a menu here instead of a help screen. You can go right to how to play instead. Uh, we've got some more tool tips, so you can see what the card text is just by hovering over cards, which is handy. Uh, and also breaches, you can see you can hover over and you can see things like, you know, there's plus one damage on that one when it's open or the status of them and that sort of thing. So lots of little things here and there um, that we're, we've been adding to the game. Um, let's see, so Crooked Mask has, I'll show what Crooked Mask is all about here. You can also see the full Nemesis card. Um, <clears throat> Crooked Mask is all about having uh, corruptions, which are uh, a special kind of card that basically work kind of like your player cards. They get added into your hand or into your deck, but they do bad things. Uh, they, and they, they all do something get bad and something good, which is kind of the theme of Crooked Mask. It's like, you know, he's helping you, but it's corrupting you, right? Um, and so uh, you get these cards um, whenever he unleashes or his own nemesis cards tend to give you corruptions uh, and you have to resolve these uh, when they come into your hand. Uh, and there's, you know, a whole story of it as well. Uh, so the corruption deck right now is you're not allowed to see um, the cards 
because you're not allowed to know what they are. So that's actually a different thing in uh, with with corruptions here. Previously, you're allowed to look at your deck, you know, and see what all your cards are. But as you'll see, you're not going to be able to see uh, what the you're not you're not allowed to know what the corruptions are. It says here when. Uh, when you get a corruption, you may not look at it unless it's in your hand, right? So let's just play a couple turns here and see where we go. The game runs a little slowly in the editor here. That's something we're still working on. You know, optimization is, is a thing that is going to be something we focus on, but right now we haven't focused on that yet. Speeding things up. The main thing is we don't want, we want the game to function correctly, right? That's the most important thing. Uh, yeah, let's gain a bottle vortex. Never optimize too early, exactly. <laughs> you can also speed up the animations and stuff. Um, but right now we're focusing on, you know, making sure everything works properly uh, before getting too into performance. Yeah, so here's uh, Burden, uh, which says, the players collectively gain two corruptions and place them on top of their decks. So we have to choose who's going to do that. Uh, and, and then any player focuses a breach. So here you get that sort of negative and positive. Uh, so if we say, uh, yeah, so Lash right now, you can look at Lash's deck. What if we give a corruption to Lash? Uh, it pops over from there, and we see now there's six cards in the deck but we can't see what it is because we're not allowed to see what it is. So we now have the ability to, uh, you know, dynamically display, it'll be a card back if you don't know what that card is. Or if you say your deck gets shuffled, uh, it'll show card backs because you don't know what card is which. Uh, and sure, we can have Zexos gain corruption as well. And yeah, here we get to focus a breach and it says anyone can. So let's have Lash book that breach, which is getting close to being opened. Delicious. Hey, Chris from Asmati. Yeah, that was something that was pretty important for Crooked Mask, especially here. All right, so uh, we'll play some cards here. Flare is going to is a spell, so let's get prepped. And we'll play these crystals. get that burning opal, but we don't have enough dollars for that. Let's just get a diamond cluster. Thanks. We have been spending a lot of time on making it look snazzy. <laughs> Still more snazzy to go. So here's a corruption card it has been drawn into hand but it's not his turn yet, but we can still have a look at it. Uh, oh, actually it should, let me show, that's funny, it should be showing uh, the front of that, that's a bug there. Uh, I'll have to look at what's up there. Uh, but we can see in the tooltip, uh, Gravehold suffers two damage, look at the top card of your deck, you may destroy it, uh, and destroy this. So you get a benefit of fitting your deck, but also Gravehold suffers two damage. I was going to note uh, in the Trello board here when I'll just actually add it on this Crooked Mask card. When Corruption is in hand, roll a card is showing card back. So that, that could be an issue in the engine because the engine is controlling, deciding whether um, to show, like whether we know about that or not, and it might be not resetting that. And the, the UI is like, oh, I'm not supposed to show it when I bring it up full. Uh, we have a couple sparks. We may as well cast those because we have two more to put in. Yeah, the things are just really slow when I'm streaming here. <laughs> it definitely plays a lot faster when you're normally playing it. I just want to go through a little bit of the mechanics of um, Crooked Mask here. So once we get... Uh, get to Zaxos and have the corruption activate, then we'll, we'll zoom in on focusing on doing some work. Uh, 
Yeah, let's grab another bottle vortex. I like destroying cards. And Lash gets a turn. Which means the Nemesis is going to go next. Yeah, I can reveal the top card of the deck. Surprise, it's Crooked Mask. Goes back. Don't, shouldn't probably have to answer top or bottom when there's only one, <laughs> but that's okay. That's a small thing. Jennifer said that the tooltip for breaches is coming up. That's, that's okay, I think. It's going to be okay. Oh, it shouldn't be over the button, though. That's something that it should be only popping up when I'm on this part, so I'll look at fixing that. Uh, okay, so let's buy a Lava Tendril. Why not? Mainly we just want to get to Zaxos' turn here. Or another, someone else with a corruption in their hand. And we can see that happen. There's another corruption. Suffer when damage destroy a non-corruption card in hand. And when you destroy corruption cards, they actually go back to the deck. So we got a regular Nemesis power card here. We reshuffle the turn order deck. Of course, and the one mage who doesn't have a corruption goes. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, cast one spark. Save a slot for the other one. Actually, I'm trying to destroy the spark anyways. So we'll finish. Hi, Satalis, thanks. I'm glad you're excited for it. And we're happy to show it off. Um, hopefully we'll be showing more of it on our streams as well soon. Oh look, I drew another spark. I guess I could have looked to see what my card draw was going to be. And maybe I will grab an amber and drag it to my deck. Oh yeah, streaming on this computer is... That's why I, now when I do Handleber Live, I actually stream, I play the game on my iPad and have it capture that on the computer and it works much better than having the streaming and the game running on the same computer. For the, this little computer. We get another power. Those are doing bad things for us. All right, here's Zaxos. So we get a corruption it damaged uh, Gravehold, and then it is revealing, yeah, it's revealing the top card of your deck. Actually, this is one that's not working right. <laughs> so maybe we can pause here and actually fix it. So, uh, so yeah, this is the, um, this is one that I had on my list to Fix up. There's a few that have issues that I need David to, to fix up in the engine, but this one, the Grim Sight, uh, is one that is being a little funky because what it does uh, is it um, reveals the top cater deck and you can choose to destroy it. So right now the only thing you get to do, like you can see that this here is showing skip destroy, but it's actually like not clickable because with this reveal window has popped up. What we need to be able to do is, you know, click, uh, skip the destroy here. You can click on it to destroy it uh, versus st skipping it. So I can actually proceed by like clicking it here, right? And destroying it, but I can't decide not to destroy it. And also it doesn't close this window. <laughs> so that's not great. Um, we want that interaction to actually work in a nice way. So let's see if we can uh, do that. Uh, I can set up my 
debug settings here to resume from the same spot. Uh, I need to actually make it resume from a little earlier. Let's do this. Uh, and end. All our, these are all our debugging save files. And we want this to be load up from the startup term. Beating in development is much different from web development. Yeah, it's the same process. <laughs> go. All right, let me just go into game view. And we have it set up so if we start the game from here, it'll load up my debug settings, uh, which right now is going to continue that game from that file. And we can focus in on this issue. Uh, looks like it saved it too late. Try the earlier one. Maybe at the determine next turn part. There we go. All right. So now we're getting that. Uh, Corruption, and so things happened. Uh, basically, the, it did the damage to Gravehold. Hey, thanks Andromeda Echo for the subscription for two months. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we got the deal damage action here, and Grim Sight is causing it. Uh, we revealed Spark, which moves that into the revealed area. Why did I have to resubscribe? Uh, yeah, with Twitch, Twitch Prime, you have to do it every month. You can't like set it to automatically go. It's is what it is, <laughs> I guess. It's what Amazon decided to do. Um, but you can continue to subscribe as long as you want. Uh, I don't know if they're encouraging people to change their subs or what, but that's just how they do it. Uh, so yeah, so we got. Um, this revealed area, and so we are, it is properly, you know, setting up the activation on that card so that when you click on it, it gets destroyed. But we want, like, this dialogue to say, like, you know, click to destroy it, you know, and maybe have a skip button there. So we're gonna have to, I think, build a new, a little bit of a new feature here for that because previously there's no, like, it just didn't work quite the same way, right? Like, it wasn't, uh, when that reveal card comes up, it's something else like, you know, maybe you have to click all of them. You can't like skip, it's not optional. This is the first time it's been something that is optional. So uh, so let's look and see what's going on there. So I think it is doing a destroy card activation view. And um, I think we also, where's that get shown? I think maybe reveal cards action. So with reveal cards action, it does. It, all it does is like clear that label. Uh, what else uses this reveal area view? Looks like this bulk move cards action. Okay, so yeah, I saw that going off. The bulk move cards action is moving the cards uh, there. It's also not using this thing though. <laughs> uh, adding card view. Yeah, so this is actually a location view, which is a regular thing. So it's, I think this is one case where the game is just sort of doing things in a way that uh, works out, but we're not controlling it as much directly, right? Uh, so here we're creating the card views uh, for that. Nightbot, you're still talking about the one year anniversary. We need to change that <laughs> to talk about Eon's End coming soon. Or I don't know what. I mean, you can still donate to the charity. I, I'm pro that. Uh, cool. So yeah, I think what's happening is this bulk move cards action is uh, doing that. Right. So yeah. So here, if, if we're revealing cards, 
from the deck to the reveal area, we're going to show it. So we're doing that and then we're um, moving the cards there. So, so we're showing that reveal area and then the other, this joy card activation is, you know, finding the card view for it, putting the activation on, that's all fine. Um, but we're not, you know, this, these are all interactions that are working fine in the normal experience of the game, but this is sort of a special, special case, right? So activate for destroy card is going to need to, um, you know, maybe update that uh, reveal area. Um, yeah, what is updating that hint label? Curious here. Yeah, so select card activation is uh, used a lot with the reveal area and it's um, setting that hint. Uh, but we're not using select card activation here, right? We're using destroy card activation, which is why um, it's doing something a little different. So what we can do here is actually have this destroy card activation know about the reveal card view too and be able to update it. So let's do that. Um, and we can do the same thing we do for uh, for select card activation. Basically, like if if that reveal area is there, we can give it the same hint that we are going to do. Um, and we're going to have to update this text, but we'll do that. Um, we'll do that a little later. Uh, yeah, let's do this. We're actually going to just generate this text no matter what. And we're going to set it. Okay. So this, if we have a reveal area, like what I'm going, trying to do here is to get uh, at least get that to show the hint, and then we can continue moving forward from there. I think we, we've narrowed it on the flow that, that it's going into is the main thing here, right? So our reveal area view is here. Just to compile. Hey, Take Walker, welcome. All right, we'll give, hook up that reveal area panel and let's run the scene again. Hey, look, we got our little hint. So obviously there's still some issues there, but uh, that is something. Uh, so the, what I want to do here is, I want to have a hint that says something like, you know, click a card to destroy it. That seems like good. Um, I also want this skip button to be available here. So whether it's like potentially available, I mean, I don't think it's ideal that it would, like you could imagine that it could come up like wherever it is in here, right? Like. Um, we could make it come to the foreground from back there. Uh, like we could, uh, there's a way that we have a thing to make it come to the foreground, but if there are too many revealed cards that would um, potentially not be visible or be super, a little awkward, let's Let's do it that way to begin with and let's see uh, what happens. Uh, first, let's update this label. So uh, I think this hint should say, you know, if it's all, um, if all the activations um, are in revealed. So yeah, so I'll go through what this code is doing. Um, so, Uh, what this update hint, it's getting past this to uh, whenever 
it shows, and so maybe we can show a different a different hint message based on on that. Um, and so we want for destroying cards, we want to say, you know, click all click a card in your hand if it's only affecting your hand cards, or click a hand card in your discard if it's only in the discard, and and so on. Right. So uh, so this is looking at. Uh, Destroy card activations, we get a whole bunch of them, right? Because you get one for each card. And so we need to look at all the activations in the activations group, find those destroy card activations, and see, are they all for the hand? If so, we want to say, you know, hand. If they're all for a discard, we want to say for the discard. Um, if they're all in revealed, I don't know if... Uh, yeah, there's no little helper for that, but that's okay. We can just do an actual check. Reveal area. Uh, if they're all the reveal area, then um, we don't want it to really be the same thing. <laughs> so maybe we'll um, we'll do a little something different. We'll like actually specify the text. So. We'll do is this. So what we're going to do is uh, make this location text. Actually, no. Well, yeah. We'll, okay. We'll we'll be able to specify the text in one of these else ifs directly. But then, if if we overwrite it directly, then we'll we'll just use it. Otherwise, we'll we'll create it with this location text thing. Why are you spinning? Come on, Visual Studio. Hi, Cat Dreaming. Welcome to the dev stream. 18 viewers, pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, my editor is freezing. That's less good. Anytime now, Visual Studio. Force quit. Can't even force quit. Oh, there we go. Let's try this again. Uh, it is in C Sharp, Cat Dreaming. Uh, developing for Unity Game Engine. So we build um, all of our games in C Sharp. Uh, both the, we build a low level library for the rules of the game, uh, as well as, and the content, and uh, like text content, and then uh, the, Higher level is in Unity, and that uh, you know uses that as a DLL. Uh, but uh, it's all in C sharp, pretty much. Uh, okay, back to where we were. Yeah, you did it wrong, Visual Studio. Uh, all right. If the text is null, we're going to specify it with the format string here. Oh my goodness, why is it? logging at me so much. It's just trying to be helpful and freezing by being helpful, I think. All right, so here we can just say we're not going to, we want it to be a short hint here, right? Which is um, click a card to destroy it. And we could, I mean, we could make these say like in your hand and then change that maybe. That's okay. Uh, and actually, I don't really want, if the reveal area is up, I, w I don't want the hint label to be, right? I don't want the hint label to be showing anything. I want it to only to be showing in the reveal area. So, uh, this should, yeah, let's go back and see if we're getting the hint looking right. Microsoft second take at Java, yeah. Uh, and actually, it's also, um, uh, borrows a lot from uh, Delphi. The language designer of Delphi went over to Microsoft and designed C Sharp. So a lot of things like properties and other elements of the language are, you know, come over straight from Delphi uh, that I used to use a lot, uh, which is like Object Pascal. Um, and so C Sharp has a lot of familiarity there. But if you, yeah, Java, it's very similar. Uh, to Java in terms of the, uh, the libraries as well. The string libraries and stuff are very similar. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so now we get a revealed card. We don't really have that hint formatting nicely, but it is saying the thing that we want. Uh, it is showing a blank hint, so that's not really what we want. So maybe we'll just undo that little thing we did or change it a little bit. So that's good. So yeah, we still have this. We want to, we're going to fix that formatting and we want a continue button to be visible on here. So it's going to like, yeah. We'll just get rid of this line. I think it's fine if the hint is sort of in the dimmed area uh, for now. So the other thing that's happening is the continue activation. That's what we call basically any skip button or whatever is called continue. Um, and so uh, this is coming up and it's seeing, you know, it's for destroying cards. So it, that's why it says skip destroy on it. Um, and so what we could do is make it come in front. So this one thing would be easy to do is to go dot set in front, which is a little helper we have. Um, and we need to use grab break pressure because we want to click on it. Um, right, so that's like a, a quick little thing we could do uh, to make it come in front. But the thing is we don't always want it to be in front. And so I'm probably not going to stick with this, but I want to see, like, you know, make sure it works this way um, before going ahead. Oh yeah, and I wanted to update that hint label so it won't run over the edge. That should be an easy thing to do as well. Let's pop open the panel. Yeah, the hint label is, what's it doing here? Right, it's actually just like a fixed width, but it should be, based on, should be anchored to the, to the area that it's in. So let's change this to be anchored to the sides. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we should have our hint label look better and be able to use the skip button. So we're, you know, get it to a functional point and then see where we go from there. Oh, and that is not looking right, but we do, you see that skip destroy button is now like coming over. Why is this hint label? It's like supposed to be, oh, maybe it's, oh, it's possible that the hint label is, there's something in the code that's changing it as opposed to uh, anything else. Let's look at that reveal area panel. View. Uh, and label. Uh, it's not, nothing is like, some things are setting the text, that's fine. Nothing is. It's really weird. Uh, this hint label, if it's anchored to those. Why? Why would it be? Oh, is it? Oh, is it in the layer group? Yeah. So this has a layer group that is controlling the size of things. So that's uh, right. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. It's interesting that it allows me to change this then. Oh, because I do have an ignore layout on it. But why would it go wrong? Having some weird issues with layouts sometimes here in uh, with auto sizing. Let's see what it's doing. Like it's 
set to 2020 on the left and right. Now it's somehow becomes minus 100 to 100. That doesn't, there's no reason that that would happen. Why is that happening? It's got ignore layout on it. The layout group shouldn't be changing it. Text Mesh Pro doing something. Turn off auto size, just give it a fixed size. You got some things that you're doing here. Doesn't look like it. Try that. Just turn off auto size. I've been having some weird issues with auto sizing in Mesh Pro. like, oh, I'm changing my transform too bad. <laughs> it could be the content size bitter, actually. Uh, changing it, that is possible. And I don't know if there's a way to say like, hey, content size bitter, don't change this element, right? Like it's going to change everything inside. And I think I've had issues, this, the issues I've had is with content size fitter. And that is annoying. So yeah, it also like ramped up that font size on me, right? Like there's not, like this is the kind of weird, the content size fitter behavior with Text Mesh Pro is I think the weird stuff that I've been, been running into. And I don't think there's a way to disable that. Like I do want content size fitter. What content size fitter on this is, is basically like, it'll make this window go bigger when it needs to be bigger. but I don't want it to apply to this label. So I've got ignore layout. <laughs> uh, that's really annoying. I think that's why this wasn't set to stretch. It was probably set to just be a fixed size so that it wouldn't try to expand. But the problem is then it like, it doesn't shrink. Right. These are the exciting things of game development that you don't hear about, except on this stream. <laughs> yeah, so here are, but then the font size like jumps to 36, like what even? And it also changed the width here. That has to be that content size fitter, right? Like there's nothing, we disable that entirely. So I think what I need to do is have the hint label be outside of that. Spend about 45 minutes breaking and reassembling a layout, yeah. Uh, it's still happening. What? <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna, what am I gonna do? That can be fine. This hint label, it's gonna come out and live below or like just live there and not be controlled by anything and like you're not set to change your size <laughs> you're not set to do anything else 
just be there. Let's see. I spent uh, too much time on the charge effect pop-ups to try to, like these are, where these pop-ups were like dynamically sizing to like, sure, like, you know, like have the pop-up show the right size. And then, why, how is this label doubling its size? That makes no sense. It's also changing its width. Like what is literally possibly affecting this thing? This label is like, there's gotta be something referencing it and changing it. Like, but the only thing in the code is setting the text, setting the text, setting the text. Unity bug. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Jeremy. Uh, this is not what I want to be working on. <laughs> Uh, well, we don't need a layout element control on it. That shouldn't matter, but... This... Reveal area view... Like, the only thing I can think of is that there's something that's like... Going over all the children of the view and doing something. That doesn't even make sense. Yeah, those aren't doing anything like that. Uh, nothing here is referencing it. I guess this, yeah, that hint, that's the hint label connection that I have otherwise. Um, it's really weird. So this is just like sitting here, right? It's not even like I'll put it down the bottom of the screen. <laughs> it's not related to that window anymore. It's a sibling of it. This thing is changing its size and fitting whatever is fitting. That's fine. Like it's literally just a label at 18 points to make it 15 points. Sitting where it is. I wonder if I start with an active, if that makes a difference. Or so we can watch it change if that's the case. All right, well, that ha acted as expected. So, what if I hide the panel? Maybe try turning it off and on again, exactly. And here, now suddenly, the width has changed and the font size changed on me without <laughs> all right let's make a new label there's got to be something messed up in the in something all right we're gonna put this Up here, uh, we're gonna give it 15 points, and it's gonna be 150 wide. And let's see if it also exhibits the same behavior. It does not. 
so that's something. What if I say that that's the hint label? By just assigning it. It also goes giant. Okay, so for some reason, when we assign that, all we're doing is literally assigning text to the field. Like, that is the only thing we're doing. <laughs> is it that we're assigning the text before it's active and that is making Text Mesh Pro like freak out? But here, it, it's only upsetting it then. Let me make a... method here so no one has to be getting into its business. Label, yeah, exactly. Ow, anything can consume a lot of time. Actually, I can make I can just do this. Nah. Yeah. When you're setting, I mean, it could be that setting null here is what's causing a problem. Um, Now nothing is refer referring to this hint label except inside here, and then I'm just going to comment this out so it doesn't actually set the hint text, and we'll see if it... Is the music playlist listed anywhere? This is just the Rageborn background music <laughs> playing over and over again. It's not really a playlist. must not have saved all the things. Save all the files. Because it, it got the text, but then didn't do the problem. So I think I missed saving one spot. Yeah. So that clues me in that maybe setting the text to null is causing Text Mesh Pro to freak out, which maybe is what caused that other weird problem, but probably not that was other weird stuff. Sometimes you just run into a problem that is like this. And sometimes it's live on the internet. <laughs> Let's see. It's part of the excitement. All right, what we want to see here is the labels to be the size, the original size, but not have any hint text. Should just have the original. Yeah. Okay. So, is it as simple as put an empty string? Because that would be annoying. Bless you for creating a string development on the internet. Yeah. It's. Uh, we've done it quite a bit, and it's you know, it's all right. The main thing is we want to make sure to not like lose a lot of productivity and the way we do it is basically just sort of fly in the wall mostly so uh, we're not losing a ton of productivity. Oh right, I still had that comment today so this isn't going to be anything. Uh, so we're going to actually do this but we're passing empty string instead of null 
And if that fixes it, then I don't know. <laughs> but we'll just go with it. That's the other half of, of software development. And look at that. It got the hint, it is passing null, text mesh pro freaks out. All right, so that's fun. So what I'm gonna do is basically revert the changes I made to the game view here because mostly they were just messing around with stuff, trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, let's discard the changes in that. I only hooked up one thing I think that I need to redo, so. And that's why we use source control. Well, many reasons to use source control. That's one reason. So I think in Activation View Factory, we hooked up the reveal area view. That was like the only thing we really did, right? And that's just changing the scene. We converted the scene. I left all the other things in place. So now it, it looks great. I mean, the, the hint label probably, actually it might be fine because it, well, actually it wasn't set up to be anchored probably, right? So we probably still need to make that adjustment. But I mean, that looks great now. <laughs> Even though the hint label is not like anchored, it's like, that's the smallest this screen ever is. So like, it looks fine. And we could make it like widen out because now it's working properly. Uh, instead of being that, we can make it like connect to the sides, which is what I originally tried to do. Thanks DDR man for watching and have a good time wherever you're going. All right, we got our hint label hooked up to the sides now, and yep. And now if I like make this window bigger, oh, it's with the content size fitter, it doesn't want to, but if I do that, just play around the, yeah. Things screw up when it's really little, but that's okay, it's never gonna be that little. Uh, okay, so, that is good. I don't know why that weird issue was happening, but mental note, don't put null in a text mesh pro label now because it's causing weird problems. Should just do nothing. Uh, so yeah, the main thing now is that skip destroy. I'd probably rather, I mean, right now it's functional, so I might like commit what we have. Well, I probably, I don't want to commit that continue activation change, but like, that's like, we could go, you know, say to beta testers or something with the way it is now because it does function and you can proceed. Uh, you can click card to destroy it or you can skip. But I'd rather have uh, a button be there. And there's actually a button. Uh, there's a thing. Why isn't this showing up? Uh, there's Uh, a way for us to have buttons show up on here uh, that we use for different things. So, I don't know, that's funny why this button is not, oh, I guess there's just, it's just a, a blank one. Oh, it's, it's just putting a blank one there as like a spacer, I think. Uh, whereas if we have, uh, I think we have a prefab for that button. Prefab, yeah. If I like put a button in here. Oh, oh, I see. They're like they're set up a little. They're a little different here. How how they're set up is a little unusual. Um, but I think I can set up at least. Uh, I don't want to commit that continue activation change where it's sitting in the front, but I can make it so that um, the hint is showing up right, right? Uh, show hint for destroy card. On reveal, area view. Perfect. All right, so that's the first half of that, but then the continue is the other part of that. So what I'm 
it, what I'm thinking of is basically having probably not a button. I don't want a button like on each card, right? Like suppose it's revealing two cards. Let's get back to that. Suppose it's revealing two cards and you can, you know, destroy one or skip. I don't want it to like have a skip on each one. I just want there to be one button, which is why it's nice that, you know, there is the one continue button, but it's not really part of this thing. You know, I want it to be near that. Um, it doesn't need to be this specific button. Uh, it can be, you know, a special button that's maybe, you know, below here or something like that. Um, so there's a cu couple ways we could do it. We can, you know, make this button, button move, for example, and then, but then it would have to know where to move back. Um, you know, we could like put that there and then return it to where it was. That's, you know, not an unreasonable option. Um, could be a little tricky to so make sure that, you know, we do that every time and it doesn't get lost. So that's not my favorite. Uh, I think probably mainly what I want to do is have a continue button on this dialog that we can activate. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, is have that be part of this, you know, windows. Like the hint label, it'll be associated, or it can just be in the middle, I think, and just like be below there. Um, so let's, I don't know if that's a prefab. I don't think so. Why, just show me in the hierarchy where you are. And then I can clear the search and then you show up. There we go, I just had the wrong area clicked. So this continue button, uh, just has a little label in it, and it's got it's got this activation button so that we can, you know, tell it to be in front and stuff like that. Uh, I think I'm gonna make that a prefab so we can, if we change how it looks, it'll show up differently on that. So let's make it a prefab just by dragging and dropping, and then I can put that on the reveal area panel too. Yeah, I think I want it to be in this window in case the window like gets taller or shorter, like it, it will be associated with that. But we can, well, what I want to do is add a, before I do that, I want to add a layout, prevent it from joining the layout, um, of the vertical layout group. Let's do that. Let's just make it so we can see it. Uh, put it in this window and then let's hook it up so that it's going to be always at the bottom like that right so it's always going to be below but we're not going to you know it's going to be turned off by default but um you know it can still be uh turned on if we want so i'm just going to hide that and we need to hook it up in the script now so the continue activation view is what is in charge of that. Uh, we're just gonna have, the reveal area view is gonna have its own continue button. And then this can like uh, look and see if the reveal area um, is there. And if so, it will use that button instead. Um, I think is probably a reasonable way to go about it. So here we want to, Real area view. All right, so yeah, we want to get rid of this set in front call. That was just to, for our testing. Uh, and yeah, basically, we want, we don't want our main button to be like, if the reveal area view is, is visible, we want to use that button instead of our button, if that makes sense. So, um, but I don't, I don't, like it's a little tricky because I want, like basically if, if we're using the reveal area view, I want to hide our button, uh, otherwise I want to use our button, if that makes sense. So, um, so I think what we want to do is do a little check up top here, right, to see, um, which button we're going to use. 
So uh, if the reveal area view is activated and enabled, we're going to use that one. But otherwise, we're going to use our own. And I think if it's a reveal area view, we're always going to turn off our own button, right? Like that is always going to be the case. And then all the rest of this code can use this variable we made instead of always that. And I think this needs to be given a parameter. Instead of just always using our own button. Um, we might have to do a few more changes too. Uh, button dot button. <laughs> and we set the on click here. This, yeah, here's where, yeah, we have button, the button go in front and stuff, various places. But the basically, yeah, this is going to, most of the time it's going to be the regular continue button. But if um, it's this special case of a reveal area, then we're going to, you know, do all the same, exact same logic, but on the reveal area button. Um, and in the case of deactivating, I think we can just like get, we can just always deactivate both buttons. That's fine. Um, for update, update display is called when things change. And so we might want to, we might, we don't, don't know which button we want then. So I think again, we want to um, have this check. Um, to decide which button uh, to, to update. Yeah. I think, I don't know if remove listener can safely be called on both. We can try it. Look at the error if it's not the case. Uh, yeah, I think I, I want to take this logic and like make a method, but it's, it has this extra stuff that I don't always want, right? So I think we're just going to duplicate it here but without the, this part. Um, and then here we're gonna use that. And we're gonna call that. Okay. Some weirdness with the callbacks and stuff that hopefully doesn't cause a problem with for us, but. Uh, I think it should be okay. Let's get a, oh right, I didn't save the other file. <laughs> That'll do it. Inconsistent line endings, it's not my fault. We just need to hook up our continue button there, and then we need the continue activation to know about the reveal area. Oop. I mean, it could probably just have a direct connection to the continue 
button, but anyway, actually no, it needs to know if a reveal is happening, right? So before deciding which button to use. So let's see. All right. Hey, look, that's our little continue button. Uh, skip destroy. And we can click card to destroy it. So let's go through one way or the other. Let's click a card to destroy it. And that's a little awkward. We're still not hiding the, the revealed card panel. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, the continue button's on there now. Yeah, that's, that's not good. Uh, so I think we need to uh, check something there. Let's see what happens in the skip case, just to make sure. It's probably going to be the same thing, but um, Basically, we need to know like once the reveal is over, uh, we need to hide that. Which I think happens in other cases, but it's not happening here for whatever reason. We skip destroy, yeah, and we get the same thing where like we just carry on. So where, in what cases are we hiding that? That's a good question, right? Uh, Yeah, here we hide our cells when there's no card views left. So this normally happens, but why isn't it happening? Like normally when we, we finish the last card remove, we get to this and we go. But I think what's happening when we destroy a card, it's just like fading it away, right? And so, um, yeah, it's just doing that and it's not. Um, so what we could do is instead of directly doing this here, we could have location view be responsible for just for doing this stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be better. So let's in location view let's add a method. Uh, animate destroy card right and I think we can make this a coroutine in case we need to like take some time right now it's just gonna do not just do the fader um, and basically this actually we do have, yeah we have a yield all already so we're just moving this logic out of that destroy card activation view into the location view, which we do have when we're doing this. Um, and I'm going to make it virtual so the other, uh, the reveal area can add its logic. So yeah, if we are in a location and it's the hand or play area, do the fade out. Uh, and card view. And we want to call this remove card view. Yeah. We actually want to call that. Because it's not calling that, that is why. Set parent null. Yeah, I guess we also want to destroy. that remove card view is doing important stuff in the reveal area, right? So we need to make sure that we respect that. Uh, and then here we can just start our yield return. Start coroutine. Come on. Location view dot destroy. Anyway, destroy card. Uh, the card view. Boop. So that logic's just been moved over here. Actually, this doesn't need to be virtual anymore because we're calling remove card view, which is the one that uh, matters. Uh, the only 
One tricky part is, yeah, let's, this should work okay. The reveal cards, reveal area view makes itself inactive, which is gonna interrupt that coroutine. Um, so it might need to change how that works. Cause it's gonna like, where are we back? Back here, this coroutine is going to like do the remove card view and then it makes itself an actor so it doesn't get to the next spot. But I think it's actually gonna be going in here, right? It's not gonna fade out. But let's see. I think what we need to do is basically like have it set itself intended to be hidden and then fade out or something. As opposed to just set active false. So I'm gonna click to destroy it. It disappeared, but why didn't it hide the thing? Why didn't it hide the thing? You got a move card to out of game. Did it not do a destroy card action? that why let's throw the log in here and we can throw these logs too Maybe we're not getting a proper destroy card in action there. Should be, but maybe something is not going through right. All right, I'm gonna clear this. Destroy card action view, spark, the location view. Oh, but the location is null. So what it's doing, so the location view is here. Part of the reveal area. Oh, interesting that. Got that's okay. We've got this wind. This here is shouldn't have this on it. This reveal area panel is the location view. This is like a rogue component <laughs> that shouldn't be here. So it's not finding the right component. It's looking for like the parent, and it's actually should be this. Uh, that is problem let's I don't know if this is gonna fix it but it's going to help do things properly all right we got this we can clicky all right so now we it, finding the right location view, which is good. And so it didn't, it, the location was null, but that's that's fine. But basically, importantly, it closed the panel because before it was trying to close this, it was closing, it was hiding the wrong thing. 
And so it wasn't getting into the right logic, right? It was calling the logic on the wrong object. So now we proceed and go on with our game. I think we have another, another destroy card action view gets called. Oh, because it's destroying group site. Sure. And we move along to the casting phase. Oh my goodness, everything worked. Okay, so that, actually that was the source of that panel not going away with this rogue component here. So that was good to know, I guess. Uh, we can, I think, comment these out again. Uh, so yeah, so let's just run through and make sure that works okay at speed, at the speed of the editor while streaming, which is very slow. And then if that works, we'll check that skipping also works the way we expect. All right, we get our revealed card. Click to destroy it. So we get a little like, you know, the hint changes to a weird way and stuff like that, but a little glitch, but we do proceed to where we want. So that is good. And let's see if we skip, what do we get? seeds in the background but again we don't hide this because remember the only way we were hiding it is with is was if um, there weren't any cards left in it if we got the remove card view and the time it took to fix that I prepared and ate lunch yeah I should probably have lunch too <laughs> yep uh, things take time they got to go through lots of things so so we're not when we continue, we're not doing the right thing here. So, but what's happening? What's even happening when we click continue? Um, we don't need this to be up, I think, anymore. We move Grim Sight. Oh yeah, that's Grim Sight. Spark is moving from the reveal area back. Oh no, here's where it's. Yeah, I need to maybe do a little better log here. If I skip, yeah, this is a strike card activation. Continue clicked. Moving Grim Sight. Oh, so this is actually an engine issue now. When you skip, it doesn't move the card back to the deck. And it should do that. <laughs> I think we, uh, Grim Sight can look at what that does. Just open that. Boop. Uh, look at the top card of your deck, you may destroy it. Yeah, so it should go back. I mean, in the engine, it like moves to a reveal area and then whatever, but uh, this is an engine issue that it's not. Um, going back. So this is not, not something I can fix in the UI. So, uh, so this is engine issue with skipping the hint a bit glitchy. So I'm just going to note that we'll maybe fix up that hint thing. Uh, let's go over to the engine board and make a card for David to, to look at that. Uh, and then, uh, Grim Sight does not return revealed card to deck if you skip the destroy. Alright, 
So that is something that we'll have to deal with. But I think the destroy flow is working um, with the exception of that small hint, you know, glitch in how, what chose the other hint or whatever for a second. Um, let's see. So yeah, click the card to destroy it. So you'll notice if I click it, I get this quick thing that says click a card in your hand to destroy it before it continues on. And that's because it's like updating the hint again. But, so it's getting into this logic here again. But there's no more like, yeah, there's right now there's no more so the reveal area is still visible, but there, that activation is gone. So it like re resets that. So that's gonna be a little tricky um, to deal with. So I'm not gonna get into that, I think, cause that's a pretty minor glitch. Um, I think we're good to say that's enough for this. <laughs> for this particular issue I've been working on for an hour and a half now. Um, sure, so. Um, what did we do with this? We um, support, skipping, or support, continue, activation in real area. Continue activation and destroy card action, I think is what we did there. All right, so I'm gonna push those changes up and that is half of making group site work. <laughs> Let's see if there's something else we can look at um, that's interesting on a different topic. So back to my Trello board. <clears throat> All right, so there's plenty of other, there's a lot of stuff in uh, Crooked Mask is working fine. Um, and there's a few things that have engine issues or small glitches. Um, so I wanted to probably move over to a different item here. Um, wet. I guess I added. <laughs> I think I put that as a checklist item. Um, there is another interesting thing I wanted to to hook up that's a little, maybe a little more visual that we can uh, we can look at. That's not a bug, but more of a feature. So, uh, and this I will show what I'm talking about um, in the game here. So this has to do with spells like dark fire um, where you go to cast it and then you have to make a decision um, about what happens before it actually deals damage. So if I remove my continued stuff here, I have my debug settings already set up to go to that. All right, so we've got um, We've got dark fire prepped, and um, so I'm ready to cast it. And with dark fire, when you cast it, you discard up to two cards from hand, deal three damage for each card discarded this way. So what happens is you go and like, I'm gonna cast this. You drop it on the enemy. And then it doesn't know how much damage to deal, right? Because you have to discard for each damage. So, um, which is fine, it works. You can discard a crystal, sure. Discard a spark, sure. And now we know we're gonna do six damage. And so then it plays, boom, six damage. And then we carry on. But we'd like to have it be a little more, I guess, exciting, uh, but also a little more, you know, a little more information about what's going on that, you know, you're just, you're deciding to discard because this spell is currently happening. So we have, uh, Jennifer's created a couple animations. That's what this card talks about, an intermediate spell animation, so that there's like an animation happening over the target while you're doing those extra steps. So that's for Dark Fire, Consuming Void, Phoenix Flame. Uh, we need to, to have those. Um, and those animations are actually in uh, here. Yeah, Dark Fire, Damage, Intermediate. So let's see, like, we can probably like drag it on there and see what like what it looks like just by throwing it in the game 
in play mode, which is one of the great things about Unity. So I'll get to the casting phase, drop that there. So now is when we'd want that animation to be happening. So if we go to the damage target of the nemesis. Do, 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 do. Damage target. I think that is the, that's the thing that gets the particles on it and stuff. Uh, so if we just like put that on there, is it gonna look okay? Make it active. Yeah, we get this cool like, so scene view looks really wacky, but you can see we get this like swirling, kind of like pulsing thing while we're making our decision. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let's, so what we wanna do is basically during the, like, after we drag and drop, normally after we drag and drop a spell, like we then like put the, the other animation right on there. So actually I can show you that if I just like put a spark in too. And we can pause it at the right time. Yeah, okay, let's cast this spark. I'm gonna change this now to just continue so we don't have to skip ahead of those things. So if I cast a spark and then I pause it at the right time. So you see that that animation is actually in the same spot, right, where I had the other one. Um, that spark damage. So it's great. It clones the prefab we have in here, spark damage, and um, puts it on that spot. And then once it finishes playing, we carry on, right? So, um, so that's sort of how the typical thing works. We have the, the intermediate animation and then the, the final animation. So we just want to have that intermediate one. Andromeda Echo is mad because it's been two months since I last played Eon's End in the final Legacy chapter. Cool. I haven't played Legacy. I'd like to do that sometime. Maybe when I'm back in Halifax this summer, I'll play it. Uh, all right, so what, yeah, we want these intermediate ones to go. Um, so let's, we have this nice file called Spell Library. I'm actually probably gonna sneeze in a second here. We'll see, I've been able to not sneeze for a little while. Yeah, I'm gonna get some water and sneeze. And I'll be right back. Go oh, ice bears. <laughs> oh, I guess I don't really need these to be in my ears because I'm not listening to anything. Uh, legacy is so good. Cool. All right, let's get back to Unity, I think. Yeah, we want to look at the spell library here. So in spell library, we've got, uh, this is a, like a, scriptable object or whatever in Unity. So you can have basically um, a data structure that you can set up in the uh, thing. And so we have a category for casting effects, damage effects. So we actually want a new category here, which is going to be um, intermediate. So, and I'm actually gonna rename these because it says damage intermediate, but it's actually just intermediate. I think it makes sense for the name of these. There's only three right now, but you can see we have a special effect for each spell. That's one of the cool things that we've been able to do to 
you know, have some visual variety. So we need to go and update this code for the spell library to add uh, another category that we can support here. And yeah, so we have these, um, we use this uh, thing called rotors, called rotors that helps us do that. Um, and yeah, these are right to spell damage view. And so I don't even know what these are set up as. <laughs> are these a, yeah, so damage, spell damage views are just a little script that um, just potentially something we can uh, write sort of empty, uh, kind of empty things, but we can potentially add more to them. So I'm gonna add a new kind called uh, intermediate view so that um, maybe, you know, maybe we want to be able to like increase the, the effect. Like maybe if you discard a card, it like pulses or something like that. So we wanna have some code hook up here that we can, uh, can use. You can see in Spellcast View we have a, a function where you can set the target and you can, uh, it goes through all the particle trails and makes them go to the place that we want. Um, and so that gives us a little flexibility for that. Um, and so we want to set up the same kind of thing for the intermediate, uh, the intermediate animations I think too. So let's go and make a new script for that. Uh, yeah, we'll call it spell intermediate view, sure. It's not gonna do anything right now, but it will be there for, there for us. I can close some of these windows that, yeah, fine. This is basically going to be the same as this spell damage view for now. So we'll just replace that. All right, and so we need to make one of these um, collection objects for it too. Uh, I think there's some way to do it in the editor, but I'm just duplicating. <laughs> it's under this asset types folder, yeah. There's like a, you can like create from here somewhere. <laughs> I can't remember exactly how to do it, it's been a while. Uh, but I can just duplicate one of these and that will do what I want. complain a while first. Uh, intermediate view. Am I in the right file? I'm in the right file. So instead of damage, we want intermediate. So all this is doing is just basically creating that data structure connection so that we have a dictionary between string and intermediate view so we can put in the spell identifier and connect it to the actual prefab. Uh, and then so with spell library, we now want to say, add another of these, this, and we'll call it intermediate effects. Should be all to set up the 
the spell library, and then we need to add that script onto the uh, intermediate actual prefabs. They don't have it yet because I just made it. Let's open the prefab. Yeah, so we can actually just go into debug view here and replace the script. It's gonna be handy. And just do that for each of the prefabs. That was consuming void. Flame. Definitely missed one. Dark fire. Yeah, the higher difficulty options in Eon's End, I like, don't even. <laughs> it's super hard. <laughs> Game's pretty hard to begin with. Um, adding more is a lot. But I'm sure people will defeat the hardest villain on the hardest difficulty once we put it out digital and say it was easy and we we'll make it harder. All right, so we set up those prefabs now. And so let's go back to our spell library, which I love that we have a file named that because it's very is doing this oh yeah oh because I'm in debug mode go to normal mode uh, it's just very appropriate having a spell library isn't it uh, let's add a new entry and we want uh, consuming void and that's going to do this Little plus dark fire going to this Phoenix Flame. Going to this. Cool. So only those three have those intermediate ones. The other, you know, the other seventeen spells, you know, each have um, a cast and a damage. But this is the only one that has the intermediate so far. I'm sure there'll be more with expansions and stuff like that. Let's make sure we save the project uh, and. Yeah, I'm actually gonna commit this stuff right now. Well, let's make sure like the game still works. But we're gonna commit this stuff right now so that um, the next, because this is sort of a big part to make sure we have saved. Uh, yeah, make sure that we get our regular effects. There's the, that looks great, okay. Yeah, see lots of changes in here. Um, Updating those prefabs, intermediate ones, um, and adding those new classes and stuff. So, uh, add intermediate animations to spell library. I think is basically what we did there. Uh, that might have even been a checklist item. Yeah. And now integrating them into Game View is the next step. Now that we have access to them, uh, we can. Um, Actually integrate them. So let's look in the code. We don't really need um, these things, but we can look at you know where does that spell library get used uh, in this cast spell action view, in deal damage action view. So in cast spell action is when uh, we actually uh, cast a spell. So here you can see we're going to animate the spell going towards the target. Uh, we find uh, where it's coming from where it's going to. Uh, we look for a spell in the spell library that has the right effect. If it doesn't have one, then we throw a warning. So it's like, hey, we need to actually implement that. Um, and then we, um, this is this is getting uh, the cast effect. So it tells that set target. Um, and then we wait for it to go and then we uh, get rid of it. So 
Uh, and that's it, right? Like we're not doing anything else. So what we want to do is if the spell is going to need more decisions, we're going to want to add that intermediate thing onto there. So, um, yeah, so basically, so uh, we have more decisions to make. So normally in most cases, we just go straight to the deal damage action, right? And the deal damage action, it's like, all right, let's find the thing, um, get the, uh, get the spell. Yeah, here's where it gets the spell from the cast spell action, playing the damage effect, blah, blah, blah. That's the normal way. But here, we are and we are going to go to that. But first, uh, we're going to add this sort of intermediate effect. Yeah, so we need to decide, I don't know if the cast spell action will tell us that? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, what is the, norm the normal sequence where we're gonna like get, and we, maybe we do it here, maybe we do it somewhere else, but we need to know if we need to do it, right? Like that's, I mean, we don't you know, do we need to know? Like if we have an effect for it, for that spell, we could just always show it, right? Um, the reason why you might not want to is because maybe you don't have any cards in hand, right? Like, if you don't have any cards in hand to discard, then you're not going to get a decision, right? Um, but maybe it's fine, you know, we just, that it'll show the animation for like zero seconds and then go away. So that maybe is not a big deal. Um, so let's just see the normal interaction here. So when I click, I do a cast spell, activation, we get the cast spell action and moving cards and stuff. And then we're getting like a continue activation and discard player card activations and stuff like that. So like we could potentially wait for activations like that and see if they're being caused by spell action and blah, blah, blah. But I feel like it's just as easy to like see if we have an intermediate effect, right? Like if we have an intermediate effect animation, then we should just play it. Um, that seems reasonable. Uh, let's just pick it up. Talking about some strategy in the chat. Uh, yeah, so let's um, basically do the same kind of thing here. We're going to, um, all right, so we actually want this to be similar to the, um, yeah, we want this to go on, on actually onto the target view. Um, so we're gonna instantiate it onto the target view. Target view. I guess, yeah, transform. Um, and we're going to make it active. And then we're just going to, like, not do anything else, right? Like, so we do, right now, this, is, this should show it. And then it's just going to be there forever, which isn't the final, so, you know, final way we want, but it's going to be part of it. We're gonna need to hang on to it, right? And like, be able to clean it up. Uh, but uh, this should be the first part. Yeah, we are working hard on Ian's end and we will be coming to early access. Gotta keep getting all these little things done. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. And, right, so we got the like pulsing thing going on, which is cool. And that's, you know, you can see that here. Uh, and, but now, you know, it's just gonna stay there forever. So like, I can like do this and it's just gonna like carry on <laughs> forever. 
which isn't what we want, but you know, it played the damage animation and now it's just like, oh, now Spark's gonna go. So we'll just add more and more and more. That's not great. So what we wanna do, I think, is probably that target view should know about, about that effect. So let's go to damage target view and let's give this, um, give it a way that we can um, tell it about it. So it doesn't need to be necessarily like a public thing, but we can uh, create a method that we can call on it. Uh, set intermediate effect. And there we can use that class we made. Uh, spell intermediate view. And then we can keep a hold of that privately. So, do this. Uh, and then we can, we don't really need to like um, do anything but just clear it. Clear Then we can just like always call this. We don't, no one, no one else needs to, like they can just, we can just do a check here, right? If it's not null. Uh, destroy after delay. So we just say we'll get rid of it. And that this destroy after delay like gets rid of itself after the time that it's supposed to and we can customize that per spell. And we can also remove our reference to it. Um, so then we don't need to worry about like, uh, and here we could, but if, you know, I think it's probably good to clear it here in case it gets called twice or in case something gets left. And then if it's null, just nothing will happen. But if it is not null, it will clean itself up. So, so here on uh, cast spell, we can give it um, that view. Wait, is the target view? Yeah. Like, call that method. Why are you not autocomplete? And then in the deal damage action view, uh, before we, um, before we uh, are going to play the damage effect, we can um, clear the intermediate effect. And so if there's no intermediate effect, it doesn't do anything. But if there is, it will stop it. And we're probably gonna change those destroy delays to be like zero because get rid of them right away, but we'll see how it looks as well. Maybe we'll want them to sort of blend in together a little bit, right? All right, so we're going to cast this one. We get the intermediate effect to start going. I need to skip here, right? Oh, well. That's, if we skip, it won't. Maybe it won't deal damage. But that might be something we need to deal with. Uh, we'll just do one. Then, yep, the other thing went away, and then the damage happened, and we are good. And we should be able to do spark. And uh, actually, let's try the skip thing first. We'll do the spark and we'll do the skip thing. So I want to see if skipping maybe won't work because. We're not going to deal damage if it's zero. Uh, just make sure that we're fine if we don't have an intermediate one. Yep, we just get the thing and nothing happens. So let's try doing the dark fire. And not deal damage. And I'm guessing this might not do what we want. Skip discard. 
Oh, I guess it ends up with a zero damage, which maybe, I don't know if that's right, but you know what, it's okay. You still cast a spell, just didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll add like a fizzle animation or something like that. Um, so that looks good. Let's check the other ones. We've got Consuming Void. So I'm gonna go into my debug settings. I need to not continue again. Consuming Void and Phoenix Flame. Phoenix, is Phoenix Flame a unique card? No, it's not. I guess it's there. We need to have these in the supply. Let's see how these work, and maybe we actually get something done easily, unlike the other thing <laughs> that was not. Uh, cool, so we have Consuming Void. So we have a animation here, cool. Yeah, maybe these highlights could like match that blue, that would be cool, I think. Skip destroy, and we should get the animation finished. Yeah, maybe we'll want that to, well, that's something for Jennifer to adjust the delay and stuff like that to get it to look how she wants, but uh, this one you may lose a charge. I actually need to buy a charge. I guess I could just buy a charge, but I can also easily just like say, we have two charges. get that effect and now here yeah we can decide this looks really cool with the dimming I think keep charge or use the charge nice yeah I feel like I'm gonna adjust those so that they go away a little faster because they, they like outlive the damage animation which is not ideal I think um, and then we can tweak them a little more uh, let's just say destroy delay zero for now Um, and we could even like potentially do something else too. Like we could add another property for like how long to wait until you play the damage. But zero seems fine. Uh, and why do I keep losing dark fire? I guess because it's such a short name. <laughs> uh, let's try these again and see. Have a look. And we'll keep chart. Uh, we'll do the damage. Do more damage. Oh, yeah. That's looking a little better. I think you get a little less of that lingering effect, but we can adjust that. Like uh, that's something we'll talk to Jennifer about. We can update the timing of those, but they're definitely functional now. And I think looking pretty all right. So I think, I don't know if I changed the scene here. Why does it think that the scene changed? Let's look and see. We'll just make sure we save the project. Community's better about that with prefabs these days than it used to be. Oh yeah, it's like you change the scene and then there's no changes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so here we uh, integrated, integrate intermediate spell animations. Cool, that's something that's been on the to-do list for quite a little while. I'm pleased to get that done. Yeah, you can see probably when to make this card, March. <laughs> uh, and we'll say adjust timings if needed. Cool, and then Jennifer can finish up um, that. We can maybe, maybe there's a little more integration to support that, but um, that is, uh, that's it for that. 
Uh, so yeah, so you can see still a bit more to do on Crooked Mask. Uh, we're planning to get that into beta testing very soon and uh, various other things uh, before we can get into early access. So actually, I think there's probably another thing I could show you before I sign off. If there's any questions, I'm gonna be wrapping up in a minute. So feel free to shoot them into the chat and we'll see. I wanted to show you a little bit of some new stuff in the end game scene I've been working on. I'm not gonna play through a whole game, but um, so we run the end game scene here. We've got some new things. So if you uh, if you win the game, you can uh, win or lose. You can see the nemesis health, grave holds health, difficulty level. You can share a screenshot. Um, you can mouse over. The, the mages to see their uh, name and hit points. End the game action, yeah. Uh, and I can actually, this is drawing from my debug settings here so I can have more mages show up. Or we can have Crooked Mask show up. V3, we'll have Mist and we'll have Lash. And then I'll change this to V that we lost. And if you lose, it's, uh, we have it basically show totally different, which is something we haven't really done before. Um, so now we get the nemesis is like really big and the heroes or the mages are showing up here in the corner. So it's sort of like in reverse almost. Like if you win, you get this really triumphant screen. Um, it's still like a little, you know, you win for now, but uh, sort of the big, the winner of the match is shown big and then the loser is uh, shown smaller. So, and then you can again mouse over if you forget his names or what, or you want to see more information. And there's this cool article that Jennifer's got on there. Share that. Uh, yeah, get screenshots, and of course, I will go to your Steam library and stuff like that. Or on Tableau, it'll go to the typical sharing. Uh, cool. So, that's uh, where things are right now. Uh, coming along really well, and we're excited to get this into your hands soon. Uh, looks like there's not a lot of questions or anything, so I'm going to call it a stream. It's been a couple hours, uh, so thanks for watching a little peek into how the sausage is made in Aeon's End Game development. Uh, we'll be showing, uh, hopefully next week, another dev stream. We'll try to keep it rolling here and, uh, and keeping things, I guess, visible. So. Uh, that's gonna be it. So thanks for watching, uh, everyone in the chat, and I guess on YouTube if you're tuning in later on. So have a good day.